Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much, Arnoud, for the, count, uh, for the kind uh, invitation. Great to be here. Who has never heard about Plan S? Raise your hands, please. <laughs> well, that's at least reassuring. And I also need to thank very much, uh, Michiel, for uh, your very powerful opening. There was, however, one thing which shocked me, and I don't agree with. When you said the value of our business is built on copyright, I said no. The value of your business is built on the science community and its output. <laughs> all right. Plan S. Um, despite the fact that you're all familiar with it, I'm still going to take you through it and say a few words about where we stand today. We have been talking about open access for ages, as you all know. There have been zillions of declaration statements, of which the most famous were the Budapest one, the Berlin Declaration. Um, there has been all kinds of codes of conduct. Um, there were even unanimous conclusions by the 28 science ministers of the European Union, which said in 2016, during the Dutch presidency, by 2020, there should be full and immediate open access to scientific publications. That's the OA 2020 initiative. So there's a lot of talk about open access, and a lot of statements have been made by politicians and by the science community. But if you see where we stand today, and these are global figures, and I know the situation per continent or per country is difficult, we still have a long way to go before we have full and immediate open access. And that's one of the reasons why I got my assignment nine months ago from President Juncker to indeed, as was mentioned before, come up with robust policy recommendations to change the situation for once and for all. Now, when I started the work nine months ago, uh, I knew, of course, about open access, uh, but the great thing about being the special envoy of the European Union, I could really focus on that single topic and was not bothered anymore by 80 billion euro to manage or thousands of people. And it allowed me to talk with a lot of people, publishers, um, scientists, NGOs, um, you name it, and I've met with them. And as a matter of fact, I quite quickly discovered why the transition to full and immediate open access has been so slow, but also who holds the key to the solution. And that's, of course, a group of players who has not really taken the responsibility over the last 30 years, and these are the funders, the ones who hold the purse, because the one who holds the purse can change the system, of course. And that is why um, I started to develop Plan S, based on this very simple principle that if you get a grant for any member of Coalition S, which are the funding agencies which have signed up to Plan S, you can only publish in high quality open access journals or on high quality open access platforms. A very simple, straightforward principle. Then, when I started to discuss that with funding agencies, because I needed to build a coalition, um, we developed 10 points in order to back up this very simple, straightforward principle, of which the key is that authors should retain the copyrights or that things should be produced on the CCBY license. These 10 principles, I think, are relatively straightforward and make it clear how, through Plan S, we want to accelerate the transition to full and immediate open access. I found immediately a very strong ally in Mark Shields. He is the president of the European Association of Funding Agencies, called Science Europe, and he has been one of the drivers um, and persons whom I really enjoyed working to get Plan S further developed and off the ground. Now, where do we stand today with Plan S? I developed the plan before the summer. I got before the summer some 11 funding agencies from Europe agreeing to it. On the 4th of September, we went public with Plan S. And since that time, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation signed up the Wellcome Trust, um, Rijksbank Jubileum Fund, Compagnia Di Paolo. And we had quite a big surprise, I think, for many of us, when just before the Christmas break in Berlin at the O2020 conference, China announced that it would go open access and that it would support uh, Plan S. Um, we also have, in the meantime, Zambia on board, the first African country, uh, which is, I think, also quite an important step. 
And for the rest, we are negotiating with India, with Latin America, uh, um, with the United States, with funding agencies over there, in order to see that coalition as grows. Um, because that's the only way to flip the system and to change the system is coalition S is big enough and gets big enough uh, in order to put pressure on the current business uh, models. Of course, the European Commission is involved, Horizon Europe will be involved, the European Research Council is involved. I still need to update the slides because as we speak, new funding agencies are coming in. Now, when we went public with Plan S on the 4th of September, we received 70,000 tweets, and the next day, 120,000 tweets. Uh, this was just amazing, and uh, these tweets were not coming just from Europe, they come from all over the world. From Indonesia, from Mexico, from uh, Latin America. I was really surprised how many people reacted to Plan S, and I was even more surprised when I met with many of these people from different continents, how much they knew about Plan S. They knew all the 10 principles, and it was just amazing. Um, we got also a, a quick reaction from uh, Elsevier, it was a nice one, Elsevier immediately reacted saying by if you want to get information for free, go to Wikipedia. That was the reaction of Elsevier, which I remember quite well. Um, so we got a lot of support, supporting reactions from associations like the European Research Association, like the European University Association, LERU, EUA. But what moved me most were not the statements of the associations, which are of course important, but these were reactions from individual scientists. And take for instance a look at this reaction from a student from India, who makes it quite clear how difficult it is for him at the moment to do his research, and why he so much hopes that Plan S becomes a success. I realize also quite well that despite a lot of positive uh, reactions, there has also been a lot of criticism. Let's be quite fair about it. There has been an open letter signed notably by lots of chemists that was then followed by an open letter in support of Plan S, again by uh, thousands of researchers, not only chemists but also others. There have been debates between physicists and chemists whereby the physicists say, what's your problem, you know, work like us. We have archive, we have scope three. Why can't you not work like us, you chemists? Why are you causing so many trouble? So it led to enormous amount of debates. But I'm very much aware that there is criticism. I would qualify or classify the criticism in three groups. I think, first of all, the group which I consider genuine concerns, and these are notably the smaller learned societies. Uh, I met with them actually last week in London, and these are first-class organizations who run a few journals, partly hybrid, open, open access. They believe in open access, and they want to go to transition, but they don't know how, and they need help. These are sincerely concerned, and they need help, and they will get my help. Then there is a second group of criticism, which I would call the fake news, eh? like, you know, oh, Plan S is only about gold. Well, I mean, we talk about in the Ten Principles Repository, so not only about gold. Or Plan S has no attention for diamonds. Well, we recognize diamonds and platinum. So that is what I call the fake news type of uh, criticism. And then there is, for me, the third type of criticism, which I would call the more demagogical criticism, like Plan S is hampering academic freedom, or Plan S will put an end to global science cooperation, or Open Access stands for poor Peer review stands for equals, you know, predatory journals. So these criticisms were also heard and I think are very much meant to uh, destabilize, of course, the debate and the system. Now, to be fair, the strength of Plan S is also its weakness, 10 principles. And therefore, we decided to come with some more implementation guidance. On the 26th of November, our task force, led by David Sweeney from the UK and John Arne Ruttingen from Norway, presented guidance on the implementation of Plan S. And as a matter of fact, we have now put this out for public consultation. So up till the first week of February, everyone has the chance to ask questions to see if what we are putting in our implementation guidance is clear. And let me be very clear on one thing. We are not going to change these 10 principles. We are not going to suddenly change our objective. No, we want to provide clarity 
to the extent that we were not clear in our guidance documents. So the ones sending in documents or input saying, well, we don't want the um, open access, we don't believe in it, fine, but that is not the objective of our consultation. Now, if I take you quickly through this guidance uh, document, um, you will see already why a number of the concerns which were expressed earlier on are not really based on facts. In our guidance documents, we confirm the 10 principles. We make it quite clear that we want to shift to new models of academic <coughs> publishing, and we again invite policymakers, scientists, funding agencies to again negotiate together offsetting agreements to realize this move to full and immediate open access. Um, what are the requirements to be compliant with Plan S? There are three ways of being compliant with Plan S. First of all, if you publish in high quality certified open access journals on open access platforms, you are qualified. You are compliant with Plan S. We would like to see that this is DOAJ registered. The second way of being compliant with Plan S is the deposition of the articles in repositories without embargo. And there, it's not just enough to see the preprint. We would like to see the author's accepted manuscript or the version of records. And the last way to be um, compliant with Plan S, and it has been quite a big debate, is through hybrid journals, but only hybrid journals which are subject to a transformative agreement. Hybrid journals, and let's be quite clear about it between ourselves, were presented to us as a transition to full and immediate open access. This was presented following the presentation of the Finch report in the UK as a new model to accelerate and to facilitate the transfer and the transition to full and immediate open access. Well, then I say, if it's just a mechanism to transfer to full open access, give us the sunset clause. Give us the date when this will be completed. And we say a period of four years should be reasonable. And that's why we are very much pushing for transformative offsetting agreements with a very clear deadline of when then the transition has been completed. Um, sometimes when you meet with, science com with the science community, you say, well, in our specific field, there is not a good open access journal or not a good open access platform. That's why we are undertaking at the moment a gap analysis to see if that's the case. And where it is the case, we will give incentives for these journals to be set up or these platforms to be launched. As a matter of fact, the more I talk to people, the more I always discover that a person who says, well, in my specific field, there is not such a thing then very quickly find out that such a journal or a platform is existing. And that's something which I have not only discovered, but also many of my colleagues. So again, where there is this concern, we will take care of it. With regard to APCs, also a big debate. Um, let me be quite clear. I have been very much, and I'm still convinced about the cap on the APCs. We, however, decided inside Coalition S to go for the Welcome Trust approach and to say that an APC should be reasonable. And as a matter of fact, um, also there, we are going to do an in-depth study into what would be reasonable costs. I would like very much that in future, we are paying based on services which are being provided. Eh? So if you are a publishing company, you provide services, typeset, layout, uh, peer review, and that for each of the services, we say we are willing to pay a reasonable or a maximum amount. But that's something on which we are looking into at the moment. So for the time being, we are following the approach of the Wellcome Trust. Hybrids, I already mentioned to that. Um, hybrid journals is not something which is compatible with Plan S, only when hybrid journals are part of transformative agreements, and then we are more than willing to pay for APCs, we are more than willing to facilitate, but we do not want to see hybrids as a business model for the future. Um, monitoring and compliance, uh, that will be quite important, whereby, of course, we are not going to um, base the system on excessive control. This will be a trust-based approach. We will do checks, of course, but it is a trust-based approach, and that's how I think we should work with uh, the science community. The timeline is very clear. 
As of the 1st of January 2020, Plan S will have impacts on existing grants, on new grants, on new calls. That depends very much on the cyclists which is being used by the different members of Coalition S. And where there's a transformative agreement, uh, it can take four years before indeed the principles are then rolled out. Um, there's one thing which I would like to mention. I had never expected Plan S to get so much attention. And I think the fact that it is really debated worldwide shows that people feel that change is in the air and that it is time indeed for something new. And that's why I think it's very important that each one of us, and notably the publishers, come clean, as I mentioned it, as I say it in America. And the next two speakers, Rush and Judy, you know, come clean and answer two questions. First of all, do you believe that the results of publicly funded research should no longer be behind expensive paywalls? And secondly, do you think it's time for your business to move to new business models based on open access? Answer these two questions with a clear yes or no. And I think then you make everyone, and particularly me, happy. Thank you very much for your attention.